For the first time, Japanese researchers have conducted a real-life experiment that shows how some traffic jams appear for no apparent reason. They placed the 22 vehicles on a single track and asked the drivers to cruise around at a constant speed of 30 kilometers an hour. At first, traffic moved smoothly, but soon the distance between cars started to vary and vehicles clumped together at one point on the track. But the jam spread backward around the track like a shockwave at a rate of about 20 kilometers an hour. Real life jams move backward at about the same speed. V2PT In 2004, we integrated ticketing in South East Queensland, so we introduced a paper uh, ticket that allowed you to travel across all the three modes in South East Queensland, so bus, train and ferry. And the second stage of uh, integrated ticketing is the introduction of a smart card. And the smart card will enable people to store value, uh, so to, to put uh, value on the card and then to use the card for travelling around the system. V2PT
Brooke and her colleague Mark Newman studied who swapped messages with whom on a popular online dating platform in the month of January 2014. They categorize users by desirability using PageRank, one of the algorithms behind search technology. Essentially, if you receive a dozen messages from desirable users, you must be more desirable than someone who receives the same number of messages from average users. And then they asked, how far out of their league do online daters tend to go when pursuing a partner? I think people are optimistic realists. In other words, they found that both men and women tended to pursue mates just 25% more desirable than themselves. So they're being optimistic, but they're not, they're, they're also um, taking into account their own relative position within this overall desirability hierarchy. And the study did have a few more lessons for people on the market. I think one of the take-home messages from the study is women could probably afford to be more aspirational in their mate pursuit. V2PT A majority of U.S. high school students say they get bored in class every day, and more than one out of five has considered dropping out, according to a survey released on Wednesday. The survey of 81,000 students in 26 states found two-thirds of high school students complain of boredom, usually because the subject matter was irrelevant or their teachers didn't seem to care about them. V2PT.
Those of you who've never heard of the term Neo-Latin may be forgiven for thinking it's a new South American dance craze. If you're puzzled when I tell you it has something to do with the language of the Romans, take heart. Over the years, many classes who have confessed they are not really sure what it is either. Some have assumed that they are so-called Late Latin, written at the end of the Roman Empire. Others have supposed it must have been something to do with the Middle Ages. Or perhaps it's that Pseudo-Latin, which my five- and seven-year-old boys seem to have gleaned from the Harry Potter books. Useful for spells and curses that they zip one another with makeshift paper ash ones. No, in fact, Neo-Latin is more or less the same as the Latin that was written in the ancient world, Classic Latin. So what's so new about it? V2PT Now that story has been scotched as a part of a contingency planning, but it was a symptom of the dramatic turn of events in South Australia, and it flushed out other remarks from water academics and people like Tim Flannery, indicating that things were really much worse than had been foreshadowed even earlier this year. So is Adelaide, let alone some whole regions of South Australia, in serious bother? Considering that the vast amount of its drinking water comes from the beleaguered, Miri, something many of us outside the state may not have quite realized. Is there a predicament something we have to face up to as a nation? V2PT
Lawrence Stephen Lowry RBS Raw was an English artist. Many of his drawings and paintings depict Penned Leberry, Lancashire, where he lived and worked for more than 40 years, and also Salford and its surrounding areas. Lowry is famous for painting scenes of life in the industrial districts of northwest England in the mid-20th century. He developed a distinctive style of painting and is best known for his city landscapes peopled with human figures often referred to as matchstick man. He painted mysterious unpopulated landscapes, brooding portraits and the unpublished marionette works, which were only found after his death. V2PT Along the way, we have built unashamedly beautiful buildings, two of which have won and been runner-up in the prestigious United Nations World Habitat Award, the first time an Australian building has received that international honor. We rely on older concepts of Australian architecture that are heavily influenced by the bush. All residents have private verandas which allow them to socialize outdoors and also create some defensible space between their bedrooms and public areas. We use a lot of natural or soft materials and build beautiful landscape gardens. V2PT
These two paintings, both called sunflowers, are generally accepted as the finest of several depictions of the thick-stemmed, nodding blooms that Van Gogh made in 1888 and 1889 during his time in Arles. The first is now in the collection of the National Gallery in London, and the second is in the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. Van Gogh referred to this work as a repetition of the London painting. But art historians and curators have long been curious to know how different this repetition is from the first. Should it be considered a copy, an independent artwork or something in between? An extensive research project conducted over the past three years by conservation experts at both the National Gallery and the Van Gogh Museum has concluded that the second painting was not intended as an exact copy of the original example, said Ella Hendricks, a professor of conservation and restoration at the University of Amsterdam, who was the lead researcher on the project. V2PT There are some 250 million cars in America, 250 million cars in a country with just over 300 million people. And most of those vehicles, of course, are gas powered. This poses a huge challenge given the limited supplies of oil and the growing urgency of the global warming crisis. But there's good news, according to our guests today, and that is we have the know-how and the technology to build sleek, fast automobiles that don't use gasoline. These vehicles of tomorrow are powered by hydrogen, electricity, biofuels, and digital technology, and they already exist. So what's stopping us from putting them on the roads. Our guest today will help answer that. V2PT.